So I see that there are some more people coming here, but just take a seat and we keep on. Doing. So I will tell you a story about something that actually started a long time ago. And well, it just took a long time to publish it, but otherwise, not because it was complicated, but it was just because we were a bit lazy. So I will talk about disordered regions of proteins and really how they affect the length of the protein. But I, 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 I will give you a short background first. So I guess that most people, um, I don't know, but many people know about disordered regions. So disordered regions is something that was discovered, well, now it's 15 years ago, and it was, it's clear that it's quite a large part of proteins that are not in an ordered folded state, at least not all the time. Maybe they are, I mean, they could be flexible linkers, they could be folding when they bind something, or they can be disordered all the time. So th this is something that was overlooked for a long time because of course you didn't know it was disordered, you didn't, couldn't observe it, but it's quite clear that it's uh, a quite significant proportion of particular eukaryotic proteomes that are disordered. And it has been proposed that they are important for many things. They're often important for binding. So they're also important for cancer because of for the binding. For instance, you have P53, which has uh, a disordered region, which is, I guess, this is a disordered region here. And you can see that it actually can, this same small disordered region can bind here nicely in different parts. And it can actually bind to many different sites. This is like the, the, an advantage of this disordered region. It can be binding different things. So the, the idea at least of some of these disorders is that it basically when it binds, it can have, find a nice, nice folding energy and it goes down here. While if it's disordered, it binds like that, and it can then up and binding and find the right state. But it can be different, different cases. Okay, so this is, and the, one problem with these disordered proteins is that they're hard to determine experimentally. It's hard to really know what is disordered, particularly what the region is disordered, and, and what, some parts are disordered. And people don't really agree what you mean with disorder. You can dif discuss disorder in different degrees. So we have to rely on predictions. And you can do these predictions on either using some machine learning methods or some more statistical methods. So you can look at basic amino acid types. Basically, the whole definition is that disordered regions often do not have very many hydrophobic residues. There are a lot of charged residues. So they basically kind of fold, form a nice folded uh, structure. But you can also look at uh, machine learning methods that are trained on these things, and you can distinguish between short disordered regions, long disordered regions. But, but what is clear is that disordered all these methods that are disordered predictions, which are slightly hard to see here, but the whole group, uh, if I can see what it says, I uh, think of my glasses, see what part is disordered. Um, yeah, so, so the whole group here in the middle is basically disordered predictions. So they are clearly are distinguished from the other regions. There are some of the coil predictions that are kind of similar, but anyway, there's another branch out here. Other type of predictions like secondary structures here is in the sheets are very far out, and even things like um, low complexity regions and things like that are distinguished features from disordered regions. So they are, although they're not identical, disordered, disordered regions, they clearly are related to all the predictions. So we, we, we started this study maybe five years ago, observing a single thing. So we looked at, we had a problem looking, doing alignments. So we lo looked at just length variation of proteins. So we looked at, we took two homologs, in this case in yeast, <coughs> look at the difference in length. We knew that if this had been insertion or deletion, the length can be different. It can be a one residue difference, it can be a thousand residue difference. This can be the difference in length. And then, then we looked at the number of differently predicted disorder residues. So you would of course expect that a longer protein should have more disorder residues than a shorter protein. So you would expect some kind of curve like this. What is surprising is that you find this black curve. So basically, it's the average here. Is that you find about 70% of the length difference could be explained by disorder residues. So for every residue you, you add to a protein, you add 0.7 disorder residues. And background frequency is, is like 30%, 25%. So it's way much higher than you would expect by random. And well, this is just, uh, this color scheme here just says that the blue ones are for, uh, is for the 10%. So this means uh, what, how much disorder you have a protein. So the blue ones are less disordered and the red ones are most disordered. So if you only do the least disordered proteins, you find a very, very flat line. 
Well, if you find the only most, the solar protons, you find a even st st stronger one-to-one -one correlation. So this indicates that protons that have more disorder also have more length variation. And but there is a problem here. We have alignments often looked at this. And if you look at it, often have an example in the C terminal here. This part is disordered here, and you have a lot of gaps. Often is the alignments are quite hard to make, but we try to make it anyhow. And so this is an example of an alignment. And so we make a number of these alignments. In this case, it's also yeast proteins from a number of yeast fa families. We try to identify uh, insertion deletions. We have at least three, well, one outlier and two species. So, and we, so, so we try to, if, if for every gap, we try to identify, identify if it's an insertion or deletion. Of course, that means that we have to disregard a number of cases. But we can do that. And we can place it in different positions. We can, for every residue in alignment, we can say if it's a insertion deletion, we can say if it's a gap, we can say if, if it's a order or disorder regions. We can categorize these things in different, thing, in different categories. And the first thing you notice is that insertion deletions, well, one thing to mention first is that, of course, this is extremely dependent on alignment. So you have to rely on alignments, and that, that is a big area of noise. If you, don't, if you do the alignment wrong, you do things wrong. So we're trying to use edges align and try to do the best alignments we can, but it's this clearly is that's a cause of problems sometimes. Uh, so this is just a simple plot. Look at the length of a gap when you insertion deletion, and you look at the uh, so this is length and this is frequency, and this curve here are for uh, internal gaps that are so they're not in the terminal, and these side ones are for the terminal ones. So you see that the terminal ones. The frequency of the long ones is higher than for the internal ones. So basically, the gaps in the ends are longer. Nothing strange. Uh, you can also look at the, in disorder these gaps. You can see that these are the longer gap you have, the longer social deletion you have, the more disordered it is. Uh, and that's true for all types, but uh, it's maybe sharpest for the internal ones. Some Disorder gaps in the terminal, so in the end, can be very, very long. So you see, you have a high cut, high frequency uh, that are at 100 residues long. So you have big, big insertion of disorder regions in the terminal. Uh, and uh, yeah, while well, the other ones also of course, they have a tendency to be more short one than the longer one. Uh, you can also see that you have more in, uh, disorder in the gaps than you have in the aligned regions. So any, any region that has a gap has a quite high, almost twice as much disorder as an aligned region in this data set. So it means that disorder is somehow related to the gaps. So it means that it indicates a lot of insertion deletions in disorder region, or that insertion deletions cause disorder. You can look at the conservation. So this is just sequence identity for proteins that have both order and disorder regions, and the sequence identity is significantly higher for the order region than for the disorder region. So this is, not, this is for the part you can align. There are, of course, you can see there are some cases here. There are some cases which you, where you have actually quite high conservation in the disorder region, and also that they are uh, uh, even higher than in the order region. I'm not sure that's statistically significant, but it's at least there are cases where it's not always, but the big bulk is down here. On the other hand, also, in the, if you look at the fraction of gaps in disorder regions, you have many more gaps there, as we said. OK, so you can keep on doing this. So you can find some proteins that are disordered and not disordered, and there are conserved disorders. So there are also cases so like ribosomal proteins have high uh, identity, both in disorder and the order region, even high in the disorder regions and in the order regions. And, uh, uh, for instance, you have a number of functions that are uh, have conserved disorder regions, like the cytoskeleton, RNA process, the ribosome translation. So some of these proteins have the existence of disorder regions that are clearly under selective pressure. So they are, should be functional important. But we had a problem with this. We were looking at this, and the alignments are bad, and it's like it's, we are kind of depend on this. So we, we, th we thought, we, we, let's go back to our original um, uh, uh, observation that the length is dependent on disorder. So let's, let's take look at just the length. Let's ignore these alignments that are bad. So you have 
So it, we know it's difficult to, to get correct alignments. But we know also that as soon as we have one, I mean, the reason it's difficult is because we have insertion deletions. And we all know also that every insertion deletion will cause a change in the length. So let's just do this very, very simple. We look at the length difference and the number of disorder residues difference. And we have a few data sets. So basically, this is orthologs. We do this for parallels also. We actually did it for alternative splicing versions. And uh, yes, yeah, so we have the data sets. And there are kind of the length differences are in the order of an average is 20, 30, 70 residues. The proteins are five, six hundred residues. So they're, they're kind of normal proteins. There are some long differences. Uh, and it's, uh, so we, this was the, the observation we started with. So that's the same plot as before. That we, in yeast, in this data set, we have about 70% of the length difference can be explained by change in disorder numbers. If you divide this data set into uh, path of distance evolutionary relationship and you divide into different disorder content, you can get this curve. So here you have the distance, evolutionary distance, the number of mutations. So PAM1 is uh, PAM100 is here. So you have one mutation per residue, so 20% significantly. And then you divide the, the proteins into five categories in this case, like the ones that are ordered, uh, have, that have less than 2% disorder content, and the ones up to that are more or less complete disorder, or th more than 30% disorder content. And what you can see is that, and then you measure the length difference. So th th this is actually, th actually comparable scales. This is one mutation per residue, and this is 0.1 gap per residue. So if you take a disorder protein, it has maybe 8% gaps in comparison to the mutations, while all the rest of maybe only have 4%. So clearly, disorder proteins have much more gaps uh, in certain conditions. And it's kind of a linear increase here. And then, of course, somewhere it flats out. So we, said, we went back to this, this plot here and said, OK, can we try to understand why it looks like this? And, and one hint here was that the more disorder proteins are, have more are sharper slopes than other one. So we created three models. We call them protein, proteome, protein, and proximity model. So this is just models to, to what were the expected number of disorder residues uh, difference be given a length difference. So in the proteome model, we just take the average fraction of disorder residues in the proteome. So if, you, if that's 30% and you increase a protein with 10 residues, you expect three more to be disordered. Very simple. You can do it for, for each protein, which could say that because we don't, do it. if a protein is 100% disordered, we add the 10 residues, we expect them to be 100%, have 10 more residues to be uh, disordered. And then we also did a proximity model. So we basically look at, we, we, then we need to go back to the alignment, but we need to look at the alignment and say, okay, what is the fraction of disorder close to this gap? If this is 50% disordered, we expect that 50% of the residues in the gap should be disordered. And you can discuss exactly how you define the gap, uh, uh, the proximity, but it doesn't really matter. So we tried these three models to see if some of these could explain our observation. We did it on four different data sets. So the yeast data set I showed before, this is uh, uh, nematodes, so, and then the next one is insects, and the last one is the mammals. We didn't do it for bacteria, because in bacteria you don't see this difference. Bacteria has much less evolution. So we, did, we, we did it, but we didn't include it in the, in the results. So you can see in all these curves, the um, uh, black line is the observed. The green line is what you would expect from the protein model. Uh, no, the red one is what you would expect from the protein model, so this, this is the average in the, in, the, in the organism. The green one is what you take for each protein. And the blue one is we take from proximity case. So you see here, this is the typical example. You see the red one is way off from the black one. The green one gets a bit closer. And the blue one is quite similar. And this is the slightly worse. They are, uh, the blue one is not that close, but it's maybe slightly better. And this, you see the same thing. Even the green one gets quite close, and here also. So clearly, we can see that if we just make a model that assumes that the, uh, if you make an insertion deletion, the, uh, the uh, disorder content is maintained, then that explains most of it. So if you look at the numbers and the significance here, we start with uh, in yeast. Yeah. Uh, the observation was 73% per 
so 0.73 residues for each residue you add in length are disordered. In the proton with this method, it's 16 percent, so it's six, and that's 10 to minus five or lower significance, or even lower. Uh, the proton explains some part of it, but proximity models is insignificantly different from the what you observe. And for the insects, the numbers change, but uh, base, and this is actually a significant difference here, but it's, uh, it's at least getting smaller. Uh, the insects database, for some reason, this is still significant because it's a bigger data set, but it's still very close to it. Mammals is actually a perfect match here, but the difference, not, even here, the difference, this small data set, so the, it's not a statistic of significance. If you compare alternative splicing, you don't see this at all, really. You don't see alternative splicing residues uh, do not, are not, I mean, they are slightly more uh, uh, disorders residues in alternative splicing, but it's not at all such a big difference as you see here. I mean, and uh, it's no significant difference if you do it on the proton level. So, uh, what do you find here? So basically what we're saying is that uh, because you observe that length difference is linked with higher disorder content. So basically length difference, you have more higher disorder. And we, uh, however, it's only that the, if we assume that the indels, so the gaps, keep the same disorder content as occur within the ordered disorder regions, uh, so the rest is in the proximity, uh, with, as the rest is in proximity, is that basically explains this phenomenon. And if you look at it together then, basically, so that's basically what it's saying is that indels are much more frequent in disorder regions. It's not that indels cause disorder regions, it's much, very, much more the other way around. And in particular, that explains that um, uh, it, it, it's, a principle, it's a most likely just a lower selective pressure. So like you can accept in disorder region, you can accept an insertion deletion, but in the structured part, it's less likely. And I acknowledge some people who did work. So well, the, the first discovery of this was actually done by Diana. Sara has been helping with all these projects, and Rowan and Oksana helped with the, well, but most of it also, particularly Rowan. And then, if you want to go have a job in Stockholm and you're young, look at this website. There are eight assistant professorships that are available. I, mean, I, it, I, think, I think it's difficult to say that on the general scale, because it's like, it's cert certainly a lot of cases that are functional. I mean, I mean a lot of the cases are under selective pressure. That's, I mean, that, that's almost the definition of functions they are. But of course, it's clear that it seems like that, that in, at least in some cases, the length is not so important. So maybe it's important more than, I mean, as a con content, you could, I don't know how you would be able to find positive selective pressure for length variation. The, 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 if someone comes up with a good model for that and we could find it, that would be nice. So what, 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 what we want to do, what everybody else wants to do in the field is basically, I guess, is to subclassify these order regions, because there's clearly it's not one group. Basically, everything is not doing the same. That's not such each a problem, because really you have um, um, different, uh, I mean, data sets are not, the experimental data is not is quite limited and it's, not really clear of how you should classify it, but that's, I think, what would help us in that question. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, most disorder protein have, have structure when they, uh, you know, interact with their partners. So did you try to do anything, differentiate between the regions that are in contact or not in contact and see whether they have different rules about evolution and uh, co-evolution maybe, stuff like that? No, we did, well, the short answer is no, we did not do that. And it, it, it's difficult because we basically, for most of it, we have to rely on predictions and we don't really, the few cases experimentally we have that, 
that's we could probably look at it, but that, that's quite limited cases. And in this case, we would have to have ortholog. We, we have, have we started some experimental work on this, but it's well, we haven't got anything. So the idea is basically we have tried to uh, knock out these regions to see what happens in, in yeast. To see what, but it's these are these proteins are well not essential. So it's really it's, 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 we haven't got anything out of it. But that's what you would like to do. And I, I, I would also assume that most proteins fold up and in a shape, form a shape, but there's not really any good evidence that it really happens in all cases. When it's, it's, it might not do it. Uh, yeah, just quickly. Um, I was just wondering if you have any intuition as whether or not this is sort of a very general uh, mechanism of evolution at the protein level. So do, do you think this is a, a sort of a starting point for evolution even of uh, structured uh, regions? I think it's... Oh, I didn't tell you, what we, another interest we have is to, to look at de novo created proteins. And uh, P, not everybody agrees with us, but our observation from, uh, from years ago is that de novo created proteins are not disordered. So it's, it's, but it's also, it also relies on predictions. But, and it's, there are some amino acid biases. For instance, phenylalanine is very common amino acid in, in de novo created protein because it's AAA codon. And uh, that, of course, is against being disordered because it's hydrophobic. So it's, it's not uh, dec declared. I, th I, I, I would think there should be some general mechanism for protein erosion. I think nowadays I'm more, I'm just believe in much more of a selective pressure. It's really, so that's, it's, that's a simple explanation of it.